Well, good morning. Welcome. Um, I'm going to walk around a little bit uh, and, and hopefully give you a couple of nuggets. Uh, unfortunately, this is a, a, a big topic, um, and you guys are all coming from different types of facilities, so I'm going to cover some basics and some general information, um, but, but I'll, I'll be around for questions and that kind of thing uh, uh, right at the end of this and then afterwards as well. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my design management mantra, if you will, is that every receiving and reclaim system starts with an, op with an opportunity or idea. So something's happened or, or something's wanted to be, wanting to be done at your particular facility, whether that's an export house, country elevator, terminal elevator, uh, whatever it is, um, there's an opportunity or idea that's generating this. Uh, this is John McCain, uh, obviously, uh, from the Die Hard movies, but one of the things he said in there is if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Stop being part of the problem. Um, in particular, in our facilities or, or in our, our companies, uh, operations and merchandising sometimes have a little bit of a strained relationship. Um, but uh, making sure that we're on the same page or at least having the trust that we have the same goals uh, is, is truly important. And we as operators, engineers, whatever our roles are in that, we've got to make sure that, that we're not being part of the problem, we're part of the solution. So where do we begin? Where do we begin? Uh, plan by knowing our current structure and capabilities and ask the following questions to plot our course. So we certainly can't uh, plan where we want to go if we don't know where we're currently at in terms of what our operation is. What commodities and products are we handling? Are we changing um, from what we're currently doing? Is something changing in the region? Uh, those kind of things. What kind of max volumes are we going to run on a day, a week, a month, a year? Um, and that's really dictated by the region and the type of facility that you're operating. Handling, uh, when are we going to be handling those max volumes? So time of the year, uh, are, are we a harvest only? Are we something that's going to run continual year round? Are we going to be bringing in things uh, after harvest and that kind of thing. Storage structures, structures, upright, steel or concrete, warehouse, ground pile, container, vessel, trains, you know, all of those things, what exactly do we have for storage and how are we using it? Receiving systems, obviously, so truck, rail, barge, vessel, um, that can also be bags, containers, other things as well. And the reclaim system, so where are we taking this to? Is it just truck? rail, barge, vessel, container, bagging. And then lastly, what sometimes gets missed or gets overlooked is what processing are we going to do? What are we going to do to uh, whatever product we're handling? Is there drying involved, cleaning involved, aspiration, scalping, sorting, et cetera? That, I mean, you can name anything, but just because we're running a feed facility or a grain facility, when we're talking about what we're doing with our receiving and reclaim systems, what processing are we doing as a part of that? So basic equipment, uh, scales and sampling, uh, bucket elevators or legs, uh, belt, chain, screw conveyors, dryers and processing, spouts and distribution, storage, uh, gates and valves. Um, so just a little schematic there of, of some of this, um, some of those typical operations and you can substitute that vessel there for uh, anything that you might have uh, at your particular location. Second single most important point. Um, I'm not going to point out what the first one is. You'll see it, and hopefully it's a common theme throughout this as, as we get rolling here. Uh, but the, single, the second single most important point that I want you to take away from this is think, for each of your companies, think of all truck, rail, and bulk scales as a cash register. Um, I'll, tell, I'll share with you an example I had uh, early in my career that, that really helped define this and, and push this home for me, um, was working at a port facility that had communal scales. Uh, we checked them all for certification. They were all certified and that kind of thing. Uh, but we were continually losing grain. So we thought somebody was stealing. We, start, we set up video cameras. Nothing looked out of the ordinary. Uh, and then one day we happened to be there. And what they had done is they had set up a ring. They figured out that if they keyed the microphone, they were, they were each having a handheld radio. If they keyed it at a certain time, they could capture a weight hold the key, hold that weight, print the press, or press the print button, and that would be the official weight that would go, and off the, the driver would go with that grain. 
Um, it took us close to six months to figure out what it was that they were doing, and it, and it just so happened we were in there one day. Um, but it, it really drove home that point because of the amount of money that was lost just in, in that simple uh, application uh, that it really is the, everything's settled on the scales. Um, you know, and we'll also talk about, so we've got truck scales here, we've got bulk scales here, and all this includes, when I talk about a scale system, it includes the sampling, the scale, the inspection, and the certification. So, uh, you know, on, on all of our trades and, and whatever it is that we're doing product-wise, um, it is the sampling and that scale, that weight, uh, is, is how we're getting paid or how our companies are getting paid. Um, so then uh, the, there's the sampling side of it as well. All right. Mechanical and safety specifications. So we've got, uh, Lansing, we've got a written specification, mechanical specification, that goes out for all of our large projects. And I'm gonna go over a couple of these and, and just what we're looking for, what it says for us. Uh, if these work for you, if, if uh, um, you can take some nuggets out of this that, that you can apply to your projects or your facility, that's great. Uh, bucket elevators are obviously the workhorse for for any system, most of our facilities are gonna have bucket elevators of some sort, uh, but they're the workhorse. Uh, we specify detail for motor and devices, head, boot, trunking, belting, splices, cups, speed uh, in RPMs, and safety devices that uh, we wanna have on those. Uh, example language, all inspection doors shall not require a, any tools to remove and be hinged with doors with stainless steel hinges and latches Head section cell include overhead lifting devices. Anybody uh, want to take a stab at why we would do that? Why, why would we specify down to that kind of detail um, on, on our legs? If you don't, you won't get it. That's, that's great. How about internal to uh, the folks that are going to be working on our equipment? Absolutely. Uh, if, they've, if they've got to take a bunch of tools up, and they may do that, they may take them up, but it's, I almost guarantee you it's not going to get back on there unless it's easy for them to do uh, both getting it off and putting it back on. Um, the overhead lifting devices are simply to make sure that when something goes wrong, and at some point in time something's going to happen that we're going to need to get uh, the motor, the gearbox, bearings, uh, something off of whatever that, that uh, top section is and down to the ground um, that we're not having to necessarily rent a crane uh, or, or come up with another way to uh, get those down. Uh, includes mounting bearings externally to the ca leg casing and includes belt slippage detection, belt alignment, hot bearing detection. All legs shall have belt alignment switches, forehead, foretail, all wiring and flex conduit. So we, we specify very detailed what it is that we want and require uh, when, when somebody's bidding a project for us. So here's just some example pictures of, of what we've done um, with our facilities. Uh, you can see all of these transitions have, and I don't know if you can see it quite in detail, but there is uh, uh, there's ceramic lining in, in these impact points in, in high friction areas. Uh, we've got lifting devices, uh, as you can see here, that's the lifting arms there. There's three of them on, on this one, uh, is what I was trying to show there. Uh, one of the things I do want to say, just clarification, uh, any pictures that have vendor information on them, I, I'm, I'm not endorsing or, or supporting or pushing those particular projects or products. They just happen to be the, the best picture that I had at the time from our facility. So um, slow down device and a uh, bearing temp device on, on uh, boot section. Uh, and plug switch that uh, is being installed, hasn't had the electrical run to it yet, but it is there. Uh, the key with these is making sure that they are placed in the right place so that you're not kicking out um, whatever is being used. You're not kicking it out off, often just because a kernel is hitting it or something like that. Um, receiving and reclaim bucket elevators. So these are the things uh, that we are looking for coming back from the contractor uh, at the end of a uh, project. So contractor shall provide Lansing Trade Group project manager the following information. Uh, leg capacities based on cup fill plus 10%. Uh, 
uh, size and type of leg head and tail pulley shaft, shafting and keyways, size and type of buckets and bolts with vent patterns, uh, bucket si spacing, uh, center to center distance between head and tail pulley and bottom of boot uh, to center line of head pulley. Length of belt and type of splice, brand size and width of belting, uh, type of take up floating or screw, um, head pulley in RPMs and belt speed and feet per minute, uh, type and size of motor and reducer couplings, uh, pulley shivs and drive belt. Um, so this, this is all the expected information that we have coming back from this. Uh, the majority of the time, we want to keep as much common as we can between uh, uh, our different systems. Um, so we'll try to size the legs uh, appropriately uh, to one another so that, that we don't have, a, have to have a bunch of spare parts on hand. Uh, we can have one that would commonly go for uh, multiple systems. Uh, enclosed in conventional belt conveyors, again, we specify detail for motor belts, head tail pulley, uh, housing idlers, belting, splices, our speed and safety devices. Again, a, a example language, the belt conveyor is to have equal length offset load carrying idlers, idlers placed at a load point uh, to be half speed, or half space, sorry. Uh, transitioning idles, idlers are to be used at the head and tail pulleys, and I'll show you an example of that here in a second. Um, enclosed belt conveyors utilizing uh, spool type idlers or the, the bell type idlers uh, will be considered as an alternative to multiple roll idlers uh, as we specified above. So it, we can use it as an alternative if, if somebody wants to do that, but we need to talk about it. We specifically want uh, the uh, uh, equal uh, length offset idlers. Um, they'll be able to be greased from the outside of the conveyor housing and from a single side. Uh, side by the op side to be determined by Lansing Trade Group. So anatomy of a conveyor. Um, so we've got on here uh, some of the transition idlers when we go from both the, the tail section and the head section coming back, but you can see it better here, where if we're using 45 degree uh, in the middle of the belt, we go maybe to a 20 and then a 35 before we get to uh, the uh, 45. Um, this obviously shows an open belt conveyor, but um, this would easily be uh, closed. The front of it's got a gravity take up, um, and it's located in the front. Uh, seen them both in the middle, towards the end, um, all kinds of different scenarios. But I just wanted to, to point out that, you know, it is, depending on your different preferences, what experience you have uh, is oftentimes, and even your, your, you know, the folks in your company may dictate what you have to use and when. So, um, but just some of the differences. And then coming back after uh, uh, what we're expecting from the contractor to provide for us uh, is the project manager, the following information. So belt capacity, uh, size and type of head and tail pulleys, shaft size and keyways, uh, speed and type space of carrying idlers, size and type of return idlers, uh, center to center distance between head and tail pulley and angle of incline, uh, length and width of belt and types of splice, head pulley, RPM, belt speed, and then type of motor and reducer, shivs, pulleys, belts. So I'm going to go through one more uh, and then we'll get to hopefully a, a, an example or two uh, where we can talk more numbers. So um, again, for in mass or drag conveyors, uh, we specify detail for motor uh, drives, all, all, essentially all the same things we did for the previous two. Uh, example language, screw type chain tensioner with slack chain detection device to sound alarm. Uh, motion switches shall be re required. Uh, pressure relief door at discharge plug switch uh, to shut drag off. So here we go. So this is just showing a couple of the examples. Bearing temperature uh, sensor on, on the tail side, uh, rotation de detection on it, rotation sensor, slack chain towards the front. Um, a plug switch or blockage detector on the, on the very front end of it. Uh, level detectors within uh, the discharges of this particular drag. And then uh, for those that have a, uh, a percentage gate on them, uh, they've got the open and close sensor on there as well. Here's an example of the uh, bypass inlet. 
so instead of having that drain flow directly through, uh, it, it brings it to the bottom side uh, of the conveyor uh, where it's in, in completely uh, stays off the top. Here's what that same thing looks like installed. Um, as you can see, there's kind of a, a hog backer uh, on top of that, and then the grain flows around the top chain uh, to be taken away by the bottom chain. So coming out of that, again, what they provide to us is the conveyor, the conveyor capacity. There we go. Uh, size and type, ultimate strength of the chain, center to center distance between head and tail sprockets, chain speed, feet per minute, uh, type and size of motor, reducer, shaft, keyways, pulleys, shivs, uh, and the drive belt size. Uh, installed incline angle and distance from center inlet to the center of the tail sprocket. So one of the key things I want you to also take away from here, sorry, whoops, which way I go? I went the wrong way there. Uh, is design with maintenance in mind. Uh, the reality is most of us, all of us like uh, bright and shiny things and, and that kind of thing, but the, the reality is most of us operate or, or work at facilities that are 10, 20, 50, 100 years old. Um, oftentimes that, you know, maintenance or, or safety were not necessarily uh, considerations when they were built. But as we come to today in today's technology, uh, we are very apt and able to design in maintenance, which we know we're going to have to do at some point in time, as well as safety. Um, so talking through that a little bit, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, an author of uh, several books, uh, was, was really big in the 70s and, and late 80s. But uh, I love this quote, uh, used it throughout my career. But a flaw in the human character, everybody wants to build, nobody wants to do maintenance. Um, just proves that point that everybody likes the bright, shiny objects, new facilities, and that kind of thing. Uh, and they really don't want to do maintenance. But, you know, as you know from your facilities, even from your car, let's use that uh, or, or truck, that if you don't do maintenance on it, it can be the, the, the newest, best-looking thing in the world. But if you don't change the oil, uh, eventually it's going to not work for you. Um, so I like this quote. Access to drive and motor, tail sections, intermediate bearings, grease zerks, uh, structures, and safety devices. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here in a second. Uh, work maintenance platforms and catwalks. And then make it, as we were talking about just a few minutes ago, make it easy to maintain, and your team will do that. What I want to show you from this picture is on this, this head section here, there is no work platform. The only way to get to the opposite side, which there's a little bit of room, um, is to actually climb over that conveyor. To get access to that motor from the backside, you've got to climb over the conveyor. Not a great design. It wouldn't have cost a whole lot more money to put a, a three or four foot work platform around there. Uh, in, all, in all likelihood, you wouldn't even have to support it any more than what's already there, and then you could easily walk around it. Uh, the other thing I want to show from this picture is you can see the crane in the background. Uh, these are two stadiums that we built, and when we built them, what we didn't do was put any kind of catwalk on the side of that conveyor going out to the center tower. Um, why that was done, I don't know. That was before my time, but it wasn't done, and so we're having to go back and retro that now because there's really there's not a safe way to get to it um, whether the, the pile is full or not. Okay, so here's an example, um, and I'm gonna, this is, this is going to be real simplistic, so, um, uh, so bear with me. So our goal is, whoops, sorry. Our goal is we want to receive a truck every three minutes, okay? That's the goal. We're going to make the assumption that the average truck is 1,000 bushels. We're only handling one product or commodity. Uh, the receiving hopper capacity is 500 bushels, so we've got plenty of, of space for uh, half a storage. Uh, sample, sample, sampling and weighing are done remotely, so away from uh, the pit. We're not, we're not scaling and sampling right there on uh, the pit. So by our calculation, um, in order to do that, uh, we need a 20,000 bushel an hour system, but that's running at 100% capacity. What's the reality of running your facility or running your thing at 100% capacity? Anybody? Anybody running at 100% capacity? Not at all. So the reality is we're probably going to be more in line with an 80%. Now, you can take that to 90. It's really irrelevant, just, um, but it, for, for this example, 
80% efficiency. We've still got to run at that 20,000 bushels an hour, but we're going to need to be more like 25,000 bushels an hour capacity in order to get to our 20. Does that make sense where I'm coming up with the 80% the and, and how I size it? All right, so we need to design our system for the reality of our situation. So knowing what it is our goal is, um, if, if we think that we're going to get away with running it at 100% capacity, we're fooling ourselves. We're really going to need to design it for 80, 90, even lower if you're not running uh, uh, as efficient as, as others. But we need to be honest with ourselves about what that truly is. So here's a, here's a receiving system option. So if we can only run at about 20,000 an hour, how can we uh, gain more efficiency out of that? How can we lose the black belt time, as I'll call it, uh, in between trucks and that kind of thing? Well, one option is to add two receiving pits. So now you can still have one product. Uh, you could actually have a larger uh, receiving conveyor and leg, um, and then you can, you can alternate or stagger those trucks so that you're dumping one uh, as soon as that one completes and the grain's in the hopper, you start the next one. So they are continually flowing. The other thing is the psychological advantage is it actually looks like you're doing more work. So you've got two trucks dumping versus one, even though you may not necessarily be operating faster. All right, so receiving system uh, capacity example. Our, our goal is to receive trucks every three minutes, and we want to dry simultaneously at 10,000 bushels an hour. So our assumption is, and what, what I've put on here is what's actually changed in this example from the previous one. Still 1,000 bushels, still one product, copper is, it will hold the entire truck, sample and weight taken. But now we've got a separate wet bin to supply the dryer. Dried product is added to the receiving flow. So somewhere in there, whether that's in the receiving conveyor, in the leg, or uh, at, a, at a transfer conveyor to the final destination. Uh, but we want to do that in line uh, with the receiving of trucks. So our calculations are we got 20,000 an hour, that's the 20, or I'm sorry, 30,000 an hour, that's the 20 originally we calculated on the trucks at three minutes, and the 10,000 that we've now added from the dryer. Again, that's at 100% capacity. Our reality, again, is 80% efficiency. So in order to get that 30,000 uh, bushels, uh, we're going to need a 36 to 40,000 bushel an hour system. Does that make sense? Yes? No? If it doesn't, please let me know and I'll, I'll, uh, I, I can walk through it in a little more detail if necessary. So the recommendation uh, would be to use a dry leg at, tel at uh, 12,000 bushels an hour, 80% efficiency, that feeds the final conveyor, say up top, going to bins, uh, before storage. This allows the majority of the system to remain at 25,000 an hour uh, and only requires 40,000 an hour for that last conveyor. So it reduces your overall cost uh, and still gains you uh, the, the goal that you wanted in the first place, which was to do both of those things simultaneously. And this was supposed to be, and I, and I apologize because it's a little light, um, but what, what I'm showing here is how we've accomplished that, uh, that example of uh, we've got, I think, 30,000 uh, bushel legs here, but then these conveyors here are, uh, I'm sorry, right here are 40,000 bushels an hour. You can see that the dryer comes in um, and is added to that system. There's a dry leg here that comes in and flows. But that's in our flow diagram or in this example, that's how we've done that to reduce our cost uh, on the leg and in, in the original receiving conveyor um, and still accomplish our goal, which is to do both of those things simultaneously. All right, reclaim system capacity example. Uh, we want to load 100 cars uh, in 10 hours. Assumptions are we've got a loop track, average cars 3,600 uh, bushels, we're one product, bins are full, so we're not sweeping. Uh, sampling and weighing are, are the only process that we have uh, during this reclaim. So we're not, uh, we're not drying, we're not sorting, we're not doing any of that kind of stuff. So the calculation uh, is about 36,000 bushels an hour. Again, that's running at 100% capacity. If we put in the 80% efficiency, that means our system needs to operate at about 45,000 bushels an hour. Again, need to design our system for the reality of our situation. So if we want to do uh, you know, 
a, hundred, a, a unit train in five hours, we need to adjust accordingly and, and upsize our, our overall system. If we want to do it in 15 hours, we can downsize and, and uh, save a little bit of money that way. But uh, we just need to design it for what it is that, that we really want to accomplish and truly what we have. Ground storage, um, these last two items, one's ground storage, one's bagging. I'm not going to go through long-winded examples, a couple of pretty pictures. Uh, this is a facility that we've recently uh, built. This was the original design uh, for a 2 million bushel pod. Um, it just came online this last week, uh, just in time for harvest. Uh, but what we've done here is we've got a probe stand here. This is the entrance and exit road. We've got a single scale, truck scale here, remote printer, little scale office. Uh, we've got actually two uh, uh, double drive over pilers on this side and then single lane for trucks to get back uh, off on that side. Um, it is 150 feet wide by uh, 700 feet, 750 feet long. Um, so that was the original design for it. Here's a picture of it uh, completed uh, or near completion uh, just a little while ago. So you can see our piler there on the south side. Uh, this is taken from the east side looking west. Um, so it's, it's all ready to go. Uh, we do a lot of ground storage. Uh, it's, it's easy uh, relatively. Uh, it's cost effective, obviously, uh, and there is, but there is some risk involved. Uh, this happens to be a, a very dry area, so uh, we will still tarp it, but we don't have the risk of rain like we do, say, in, in coastal Carolina or down in the Delta or those kind of places, uh, even here in the Midwest. So, uh, so I thought I'd show you that. Bagging systems, uh, we don't do a lot of this, but this particular uh, system we did, uh, it's very small in, in terms of, of the layout. I'll show you just a few pictures of it. Uh, so this hopper, and it's actually a, a truck hopper, uh, is inside the building. Uh, they use these giant totes, and, and uh, it takes only two operators. Um, they load up this, uh, this hopper here. Uh, the product flows out. Uh, through this incline conveyor there. It comes through this common wall, which is the backside here, into uh, this system here, which does the weighing, the bagging, you know, all of those things that uh, need to go into it. Comes out the bottom as a, as a finished product. It gets scanned and recorded, um, boxed up, uh, labeled, and then a robot actually stacks it on pallets uh, to go out to, uh, to be sold. So um, there's one operator on this side, one operator that's grabbing the, the finished product as well as the bulk product on the other side. Uh, but it can be in a, a very efficient way uh, to do work if you're in the bagging uh, arena. Additional points to consider. Training on equipment, um, when, when you're designing a new system, what kind of training are you going to have and involve with your team? Future expansion, uh, always plan for where you need to go, not where you are. Uh, if you plan for where you're at today, uh, you're gonna be behind as soon as you start tomorrow. So plan for where you wanna go. We don't necessarily uh, know where we're gonna be in five to 10 years, but we need to try to anticipate uh, some of the things that are gonna occur. Eliminate bottlenecks. Uh, efficiencies, well, we can do that by multiple receiving options. Um, redundant systems, can we use two legs in place of one leg? Um, and that way, if, if something happens uh, to one of the legs, we're not completely down. Uh, we're, we're, we b believe heavily in efficiency and redundant systems in most of our operations. Just an example of bottleneck. Um, you know, you validate the work that uh, goes through the operation, uh, the backflow, uh, backlog of work uh, waiting to go through the bottleneck, and you've got the bottleneck, uh, and it's your wasted capacity. So in, in this case, I would talk in terms of the, the, uh, the black belt time that we were talking about. That's an inefficiency. That's a, black, that's a bottleneck. Uh, if you're uh, scaling and weighing, I'm sorry, weighing and sampling, at the same place that you're receiving uh, whatever product it is, that could potentially be a bottleneck. Look at maybe moving uh, those two operations outside of uh, so that you can increase your flow through the facility. 
So the key nuggets I want you to take out of here. Plan your system uh, design for your future. So think about where you want to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, where your facility might be, your operation, your company, and try to plan for that. Uh, you don't have to do it solo. Work with your teams, the, the, the merchandisers that are at your company, uh, you know, the producers that maybe bring grain into you, uh, that kind of thing. Sa these, are, these are key points right here. Safety and maintenance are critical design features. Obviously, we all have to do with new regulations. Sa you've heard safety throughout not only this presentation, but, but the conference as a whole. Um, and so safety and maintenance are critical design features for any receiving and reclaim system. Waste system is your company cash register. I mean, it's just as simple as that. You're going to settle on weights. You're going to get paid on weights uh, and, and really need to uh, look at it that way. Do not plan your system to run at 100% capacity, efficiency. Um, you'll just be disappointed if you do. Um, so look at something more realistic, whether that's 80, 90%, uh, you can determine that, but just don't plan it at 100. And then create efficiency and redundancy by using multiple points for receiving and reclaim. That's all I got. Thank you.